Uh, so um, as sometimes happens when you write a talk, um, it turns out differently. I haven't actually written much on Heidegger, but on Thomas Aquinas, as you'll hear. Uh, it's probably a bit unusual for the occasion today. Thank you very much to Sean and everyone else involved in organizing this. Um, I'll start, is it maybe, yes, I'm old fashioned, so this is an old fashioned talk. And it's a bit sand in the gears, perhaps. So I start, as most of you will be aware, the title of this conference today is Humanity in the Age of Machines. Oh, sorry, Intelligent Machines. A good title that is chosen with some thought is also always more than just a title and hence reveals, willingly or not, something of its time and what is at stake in this time or age. The title wants to convey that this is now no longer the age of humans, but the age of intelligent machines. I think one has to be quite careful with such a radical hypothesis. It is still human beings who proclaim the ages, not, ma not machines, however intelligence may be defined here. The title also seems to posit a new, almost proto-metaphysical category to it, intelligent machines against which humanity is to be defined. This is reminiscent, to say the least, of Aquinian definitions of human being as opposed to deity and angels. And I should like to address here today this sub-metaphysical reference to humanitas in order to, that we know at all what it is that we might be talking about. I shall focus on Aquinas' understanding of humanity, because in Aquinas we find one of the earliest European definitions of the formerly Roman concept humanitas. Given the brevity of the format today, I can only provide a sketch of the import and meaning of humanity in Aquinas. Of course, an exhaustive account would also have to consider the long-standing European tradition of humanism and how it relates to transhumanism, as well as, I think, what one should be able is to determine precisely where in the grander logic and hierarchy of thought so-called intelligence is to be located and determined. Christoph Lütke, in his paper on Heidegger and AI, which Sean sent to me before this conference today, Lütke also explicitly refers to the history of philosophy and the need to take into account its history, not merely because philosophy needs to establish itself again and find its place, as Lütke says, but because there seems to be a renewed and genuine interest in philosophy and its concepts. The reason for this renewed interest in so-called interdisciplinarity is, in my view, that such fundamental concepts as humanity and intelligence are profoundly philosophical and mediated by philosophy. We can see this only by looking at the title of today's conference. For if humanity is to say anything, one must clarify its metaphysical content, or else all that is said only adds to the general confusion of the day. Perhaps it should also strike us as strange that such metaphysical concepts as humanity, once abandoned by Nietzsche, Derrida, and Heidegger, seem to return precisely in the moment of the emergence of AI. Thus, AI seems to demand an answer to the question what it means to be human, even if widespread popular fears of Terminator-esque AI are pres presumably exaggerated. Whoever asks for the humanity of the human asks for the essence of the human being. That is to say, any question for the humanity of the human must relate back and be brought into a mediating dialogue. Humanity and intelligence on their own say little, and precisely this fuzziness triggers the imagination and abstraction. According to Thomas Aquinas, in the humanity, distinction and demarcation against deity and angels. Humanity is a composite of rationality and animality for Aquinas, and as such serves to provide the formal unity of human being. For Aquinas, in this text of being in essence, humanitas is the essence as substantial form of an individual being. Essence in the proper sense for Aquinas designates a composition of substances. Insofar as formally speaking, and hence, Without individuating matter, humans are animals with the distinguishing and active principle of rationality. Hence, Thomas argues, quote, humanity is not the human being. One cannot say Socrates is humanity, as Aquinas says, one can only say Socrates is a human being. Put succinctly, humanity is an abstract part of the universal, itself not a universal, and on its own humanity does not address the concrete individual human being, and certainly does not give a response to the question who the human being is. Thus, references to humanity do not address the totality of humankind, but the abstract part of the universal, which, 
without material individuation does not say much about human being in their actuality. A superficial understanding of humanity might even consider humanity purely as an abstraction without the individual and wrongly hypostatize a most general humanity with certain features such as language as communication, thinking as computation, the mind as the brain, and subsequently try to model those functions only to reapply these superficial verifications back to the individual human being. Yet now that individuality disappears behind the abstraction while noting ironically the deficiencies of the human. Aquinas is certainly aware of the threat and of the misleading power of abstraction, as was his teacher Aristotle. In book seven, chapter 11 of Aristotle's Metaphysics, we find an early warning against the powers of abstractions. While it is possible, Aristotle says, to reduce everything to form, this leads to anaporia, a paradox. Aristotle writes, quote, to reduce everything in this way, that is stripping away from individuating, individuating limiting matter, and to dispose of matter is going too far, for it leads one away from the truth and makes one suppose that it is possible for a man to exist without his parts, as a circle does without the bronze sphere." End of quote from Aristotle. Of course, the fantasies of transhumanism assume just this, the technical feasibility of abstracting a particular human being from all individuating matter, generating a formal copy, copy of the mind represented as brain. One can see that the concept of humanity today, without the metaphysical substance to sustain, undergird, and nurture it, is in danger of becoming a vain abstract concept. If humanity is turned into an abstract universal in this way, an abstract universal with certain external representable attributes without a foundational grounding in at least some form of mediated metaphysics, then the abstractions of an unchecked pure rationality by support of the imagination know no bounds. It is this very formalistic abstraction of humanity which opens the gates to the fancies of transhumanism. What we can see here, and I'm coming to the end now, is that the technical sphere also operates with metaphysical concepts precisely because, as Heidegger reminds us in his talk, which was given at the Technical University of Munich in the 50s, um, technics is mediated metaphysically, which is also why Heidegger is in this liminal space um, of metaphysical language in the German that he twists free from metaphysical import. For Heidegger, the Gestell, or in framing, wants to make the world fully available and controllable. Hence, here a reduction of sense occurs, precisely because of the vast abstractions of the technical way or mode of representing and producing the world. But in some significant way, the so-called emergence of AI could also prompt us back to our senses, not, for example, I think, by assuming that contingent findings within vast random data sets uh, which wouldn't have been possible without the computational capacities of AI, disclose any sense that lasts and sustains us. That is at best, um, I think, uh, could lead to a destruction of logos. Instead, we might be able to find sense, the sense of the technological epoch, which is never to be ours, precisely when we begin to see and understand the mediating rhythm that is active even, in still, e even still today, and which philosophy has been addressed by, and has addressed ever since, so that we can say again, against the climact climactic clause of Faust's pact with the devil, Augenblick verweile doch du bist so schön, moment uh, linger on, you are so beautiful, without getting swept away by the machinations of contingency machines. Thank you very much. I'd like to start with a question. Um, you speak of abstraction. You have, you've mentioned the word abstraction a lot. Um, and I was wondering at some point that as AI is something that develops in the, with the usage and the input of many people, let's take conversational AI. If you speak to avatars that are meant to emulate a, a human that you're interacting with, would you regard that as a sort of abstraction of a human that someone is... Um, conversing with in that sense, and that this abstraction is that which um, kind of it, it represents that threat because we've, we mistake the kind of map for the territory, we mistake the abstraction for the thing, and in the same sense, uh, in terms of AI, we mistake the abstraction for the conscious human, in a sense. Uh, yes. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, but uh, so yes, um, and 
and also what so what, what I think what it what what this all prompts us to though right is and I think this is why Lipke's paper is quite strong on this. Um, it, it, he mentions in the beginning of this paper that in, in this new um, at this new research center that they have in Munich, uh, that they have a, everyone who has sort of an in-house philosopher uh, with them, if I remember correctly, right? Um, so and so it's it's really striking that the, the concepts that we use are fundamentally metaphysical. And they, they must have concepts, they must, we must be able to articulate and mediate them um, for us, for our time, or else it is, it's, it, they, 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 what we generate are what Boutelier would call a simulacra. But our, so the, the simple answer to your question is just yes. So thank you. Thank you, Anis. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think there is a question in the chat. They say, would you be ready, as John Rebecca proposed, to hand over the reins to the machine if we can know that it is wiser? Oh, well, I would, no, I would not. Because uh, I, because what, what does it mean to be wiser? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, again, if we're, we're generating copies, um, then, we, we run it, a chunk pointed this out into a Minos paradox. Uh, and, and ultimately that's something that, you know, so if, if at, at the moment that we decide this, we've meet, that, that this mediation has occurred. Um, and so we've made sense of, of what's going on. Uh, I, uh, I don't think so, you know, we're already again, a step ahead of the machine, I would say. All right. Anyone else? Um, anyone else having questions? All right, thank you very much, Johannes. I really appreciated your talk and especially the depth of it and bringing in very historical philosophers, uh, quite a different approach to what we've heard so far. Very interesting. I, I, do, I do apologize. No. <laughs> <laughs>